Our subjects family. Now there's Papa John and Mama Anna Lavecchio. And there's Sam up there. Here's Rose, Phil, Gloria, Sure, and Joe. Wonderful people. Ah, it'll be a big re reunion with their big brother, the oldest son. Here he comes in the car, is that right? Not dreaming his family his whole life are about to greet him. Let's see where he is. Oh, he's still in the car. Uh, you better, uh, someone go over and, uh, photographer, will you go over and pull him out and ask for a, for a, uh, for a uh, picture? Some way to get him out. Here he comes. He doesn't know. Come on out, folks. Come on out here. Hurry up. Right here. This is good. Oh, Daddy. Daddy, right here. Go up there a little more. There. Now, this is the man getting out of the car. Say, uh, there's a group here to meet you. Because uh, there he is. Hey, yeah. Well, <laughs> Frankie, Frankie Lane. Let me move in and up here. Frankie Lane, uh, world-famous popular singer. This is your life. <laughs> Mitch, come here. Thanks. I don't know how Mitch Miller of uh, uh, Recording Chief of Columbia Records got you down here, but boy, he did. And thank you very much. Uh, Mitch, Frankie, how you doing, pal? It's Ma a French room. I can tell you that. <laughs> Today, I know, is your wedding anniversary. You never let anything, Frankie. <laughs> You never let anything interrupt your wedding anniversary. I know that. Now, uh, your wife, Nan, is waiting. I'll never get him. Frankie! Your, your wife, Nan, is waiting inside. Nan's going to be waiting inside, and so is a whole nation of fans, so we'll all celebrate your wedding anniversary together. Okay, boy? All right. Where's now, come on, guy? everybody. <laughs> come on, everybody inside for the story of a man who would not give up until the world heard his songs. Now, uh, while we're on our way, here's our good friend Bob Warren, who backs up the statement that a beautiful life helps make a beautiful woman. Come on, gang. Come on, Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, the fellow who has sold over 30 million records because his singing is lifted in hearts all around the world, Frankie Lane, the one and only Frankie Lane. Oh. Well, your life is your family, so they're all here. Did we really fool you, Frankie? Huh? I can't. <laughs> Oh, that Mitch Miller, you'll never believe him this again. This was the you? slickest job I have ever seen. <laughs> All right, let's begin. This is your life, Frank Paul Levecchio, wow. world famous as Frankie Lane. Up in the morning, out on the job, yeah. work like the devil for my pay. For that lucky old your voice and your birth date, 1913, Frankie, zooming out of eight of your own golden records, each marking a million or more in sales. What a distance it is from Chicago's north side to fame. It isn't a lucky old son that looks down on you at first. 34 years of struggle lie ahead for you. Uh, Frankie, what's your earliest memory of singing? I can't even think of it. <laughs> Frankie, what's your name? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, the Immaculate uh, uh, Conception Church, Yes, wasn't it? I was 10 years old, and I began singing in the altar boy choir at the Immaculate Conception Church in Chicago on North Park Avenue. Didn't you used to take him to hear uh, open-air opera in the park, Mama? Yes, the Ravinia Park, and he used to love to sing at home then. <laughs> yes, so the boyhood dream of being an entertainer is born in you. Was he a good boy, Papa Levecchio? Oh, he sure was a good boy. <laughs> he obeyed Mama in every way. Yeah? And he was, he was a very good boy for every way she needed. Yeah. I bet you he, he obeyed you, too, didn't he, Bob? <laughs> huh? There was plenty to do at home, too, wasn't there, Sam? Yes, he brought us our baby bottles that would change our pants. <laughs> what? <laughs> They're on the air watching. <laughs> Depression hit Chicago in 1929. You're 16 years old. In Papa's little barber shop, things get sort of bad. The money you make after school goes to Mama. Now, you bet. When you gave him 14 cents for car fare, where did he head for, Mama? To the uh, Mary, uh, Garden Ballroom. Mm -hmm. Sometime, it was a long way. Sometime I had 14 cents, sometime I only had a seven, so he had a Ike one way back. Yeah, seven cents <laughs> or 14 cents. I used, to, I used to steal a ride on the L. <laughs> <laughs> and two bits when you had it for a ticket to the Mary Garden Ballroom opens the door for you to the world you want. I'm sure Napoleon never thirsted for a throne any more than you desired to be up on that stage someday. Frankie used to dance by my band and beg for a chance to sing. One day I handed him a megaphone and he sang a chorus for me and did a pretty good job. Remember that voice, Frankie? Leader of the orchestra? Joe Casey. At the Mary Garden Ballroom in those days. Here from Chicago where he's a talent agent now. Your good friend Joe Kayser. Come on up here. Hey. Hey. 
You got a trip out of it. Yes, Ralph. I used to bring Frank on the bandstand and let him sing with the band now and then, but for no dough. Yeah, of course not. Then Eddie Eddie Gilmartin and I, Eddie was manager of the ballroom in those days. We conceived an idea where Frankie could make a few bucks by teaching dancing. Yes, well, this led to your competing in dance marathons, didn't That's it, Frankie? Right. Uh, millions of our younger generation have never seen a dance marathon. What were they like, Joe Kayser? Well, it was a sort of a national insanity, wasn't it, Frank? <laughs> it was crazy, all right. <laughs> People used to pay money to see the kids dance and drop over. Yeah. In fact, Eddie Gilmartin took them all over the country, put them in marathons in different places. By the way, Eddie, sorry he can't be here tonight. He's ill in Chicago. But he sent a telegram, and I want you to read it after a while. Yes, and your brother John, who's in New York tonight on business, sends his best, and he's looking right out there Hi, in John. New York. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Joe Kayser. Yeah. You'll see. Thank you, Joe. Here a little later, boy. Thank you. Party. Right. You <laughs> Wrap all your troubles in dreams. Yes. Dream all your troubles away. 1930 to 1935, dance marathon days, a blur of cities and faces, an eldest son can't be a burden, and you're driven to make money any way you can to help mom and papa. Uh, Frankie, what was the longest dance marathon you were in? Can you remember? Atlantic City, 1932, on Young's Million Dollar Pier. It was 145 days, about 3,501 hours. So what, six months, something like that? About 18 days, less than five months. Wow. How did you get money uh, where, when you were in a marathon? How did you make money out of a marathon? Well, the different uh, contestants used to entertain. Mm-hmm. And the uh, people who came to watch the contest used to throw money to the people who, to the contestants who entertained. And then the other contestants would pick up the money and give it to the ones who had performed. Yeah, I see. And then if you wound up in the prize money, that would be additional. And... Um, Rose, do you remember the public throwing money? Tax-free. I sure do. <laughs> I remember Mama would chuck it in her galoshes to get it safely home. <laughs> you come home. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the uh, Arcadia Garden in 1935. Yeah, right. yeah. You come home between marathons, and the fatigue in your eyes scares Mama. Now, Papa Lavecchio, when you saw how tired uh, Frankie looked, what did you say to him? Well, I kept telling him that he should quit this dancing and singing and keeping bumping his head against the wall. But Mama knows the longing in your heart, Frankie. She always encouraged your singing, didn't she? Yes, she did. But in 1935, what does Mama say, Gloria? Well, Mom didn't want him dying, so it was to give up the marathon. Yes, so you promise. But the next five years are to prove even harder for you. Heart of my heart, I love that melody. 1935 to 1940, no song can hold the homesickness you feel during these years as you travel in search of your goal. Loving and longing for your family, you never fail to ride home, isn't that correct, Mama? Yes. He used to ride once or twice a week, he never failed. You go to Hartford, Connecticut and find work in a leather craft factory. Stanford. Was it Stanford? Wait till I check that, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you goofed. <laughs> Then on to New York you went, Frankie, New York City, sometimes finding little jobs, singing, but mostly bitter discouragement. Young people of today can learn a great lesson in persistence to know what you endured. You want to tell us how things were for you there in, the, in New York in the late 30s, Frankie? Well, it was about 1937 when I left the plant in uh, Stanford, and I stopped in New York. I went to a Sunday afternoon jam session at the Hickory House and ran into kid who was uh, raised around the same area I was in Chicago, Joe Marsala. Mm -hmm. Clarinetist who was riding real high at that time at the Hickory House. And I got to know him and he let me sing with the orchestra.